I'm Karen Perry, I'm manager of the East Brunswick Libraries Just for the Health of It Health Literacy uh, Program. And we are so honored this evening to welcome um, Dr. Dinesh Singhal, who is doing this program for us called Heart Health. Dr. Singhal is a board certified cardiologist with decades of experience serving patients. Serving patients. Dr. Singhal practices cardiology at Cardio Metabolic Institute in Somerset, Monroe Township, and East Brunswick. He also hosts a radio show called Heartbeat twice a month. Dr. Singhal is board certified in internal medicine, cardiovascular medicine, interventional cardiology, and nuclear cardiology. He is also actively involved in clinical research. He is currently a clinical associate professor of medicine at Drexel University College of Medicine in Philadelphia and was actively involved in teaching residency, residency programs at St. Peter's University Hospital and Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital in New Brunswick, where he remains affiliated today. Dr. Segal has been voted a top doctor by New Jersey Monthly Magazine. And so we are so honored to have him speak to us this evening. Before we begin, let me just ask everyone to please be sure to enter any questions that you have for Dr. Singal in the chat box as we go along through the program. You will be muted the entire program. There is no audio on your end. So please feel free to enter any questions in the chat box and Dr. Singal will address all your questions. Uh, at the end of the program. So with, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Dinesh Singhal. Welcome, Doctor. Thank you, Karen. Thank you for the kind introduction. <clears throat> so folks, uh, what I'm going to do today is we're going to talk about uh, heart health. And uh, we're going to go down um, and understand uh, what is kind of the major problem which happens with the heart. Because heart attack, heart disease is still the leading cause of of death across the globe. Uh, so we'll understand the spectrum of the, uh, the, Ill, the burden of illness. We'll, we'll understand why that happens, how we go about both diagnosing and treating uh, heart problems and what we can do to prevent them going forward because obviously we don't want this to be as big a burden as it is. So with that in mind, uh, mm -hmm. let's start. So this picture here just denotes the entire circulation system of the body. So think of it like your house, which has the main uh, uh, plumbing, which comes into the house. And then that same plumbing, the water in that plumbing goes to every different, every part of the house. So in, with, in a similar way, the heart is a pump, which when it squeezes, it sends blood to the whole body. It sends blood to the brain, it sends blood to your arms, it sends blood to all the organs within the chest and the abdomen, and it sends blood to the legs. So that same blood is floating around, and if that blood is carrying stuff which the body doesn't need, it starts kind of accumulating along the vessel walls. But when it comes to the heart, that <clears throat> these are called coronary arteries. So the heart, again, as I said, is a pump, and any pump would need energy. And that energy is supplied by blood, which comes down these arteries. And that blood is carrying the glucose and oxygen with the heart muscle needs. And these are tiny arteries. Anybody who you know, has used a scale, uh, just to give you a point of reference, uh, a, a, a really big artery is about three to four millimeters wide. And most arteries are in the 2.5 to three millimeters and uh, 3.5 millimeters in width. So they're not very big. Uh, and, but they are the ones which really cause all the trouble we, we run into. So now let's talk about what happens in these arteries. So if you take a section of this artery, this is a normal healthy artery. And this is an artery where small amount of plaque starts building up. And then this plaque kind of keeps increasing. So there is cholesterol and stuff which is floating in this bloodstream. It kind of gets underneath the wall. And over time, this plaque keeps increasing. And what happens is as this plaque keeps increasing, there is less blood flow beyond that point. And therefore, when the heart has to pump harder and more blood flow is needed, uh, not enough kind of goes through. So this is another 
um, uh, cartoon which shows again the picture of the heart, these arteries, and you see this plaque kind of build up. And there are times when uh, we reach a point where the artery is completely closed. And this can be a slow process, in which case the person may not actually feel that they had a acute problem or it can happen very suddenly. One can go from a situation where there is some flow to no flow and that's what leads to heart attacks. <clears throat> so heart attacks and heart disease is the number one leading cause of death for men and women in the United States. And this is true for most of the globe. Uh, and just some statistics, 18.2 million Americans aged 20 and older have coronary heart disease and 20% of heart attacks are actually silent. So not everybody who has a heart attack would know that, that, that they had one. And each year about close to 650,000 Americans die from heart disease. The interesting thing is that 80% of this heart disease can be prevented in some shape or form. As we go through this, you will know what we need to do to prevent this. This is a map of the United States, which kind of shows you the burden um, as you can see, you know, it's uh, uh, spread all over the country, but there is a higher preponderance of heart disease. And a large part has to do with obesity, diabetes, you know, the kind of fat which is eaten and consumed in this uh, southern part of the country. But it does afflict us all over. So the main thing which happens with, a heart, attack, with, with the heart disease is a heart attack. So what is a heart attack? So in a heart attack, you know, the artery I showed you which is normally carrying blood, at some point it closes. And we'll go through a little, this a little bit more later. But once it closes, there is no blood flow going past that point. And when that happens, there is uh, uh, both discomfort and lack of blood flow, which causes damage to that part of the heart. So that is what a heart attack is. Now, here is a, another cartoon which kind of explains this. So, this is going from young age to an older age. So it is a disease of aging in some ways. We start with a little bit of plaque buildup and as time goes by, uh, this plaque increases. Um, the core of this plaque is this yellow stuff, is this mushy stuff. As I tell my patients, I say, you know, it's like the bacon and cheese, which kind of accumulates here. There is a cap which kind of covers it. So as blood is flowing through this tube, it doesn't really see this yellow stuff. Till one day, this plaque, this, this cap cracks or ruptures. Once this cap cracks, then the blood which is going through comes in contact with this yellow stuff. And this yellow stuff has a tendency to make the blood clot. So what happens is you could, a person could have, let's say a 40 or 50% blockage. There is enough room for blood to get through. But one fine day, the, the cap ruptures and the remaining 50% is now covered with a clot. And so therefore a person could be playing tennis, running around, you know, being fine one day, and the next day they drop dead is because of this plaque rupture. So the whole story is to try and see if there's any way we can prevent this, uh, prevent this cracking of that, of that cap. So now let's see, you know, you saw what the, what, what the plaque looks like. We have to see why this happens in the first place. So these are what we call risk factors for coronary artery disease. And we kind of divide them into two buckets. One is bucket is things we can't control. So uh, women, as they get older, uh, wind up getting a higher incidence of heart disease. So we can't control that. We can control our aging, right? And we can control our genetics. So if we were born to a family which has a uh, uh, a history of premature uh, heart attack disease, uh, this uh, will pass on to us. And men, unfortunately, are more prone, especially uh, in a younger, you know, relative to women in premenopausal phase, men have a higher incidence, but women do catch up after menopause. Now, there are some risk factors, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in, in the next few slides. There are risk factors we can control. Cholesterol diabetes and high blood pressure, smoking, obesity, lack of exercise. The one thing I didn't, which is not here is, is stress <clears throat> to a certain extent. <clears throat> so one of the factors is cholesterol. So cholesterol is of two kinds. There is HDL, which is the good cholesterol. So we want more of it. 
And then there is LDL, which is the bad cholesterol, and we want less of it. So if you want an easy way to remember, L is for low, H is for high. We want more of it. So somebody who has a good high or, or a go good cholesterol is going to have healthier arteries than someone whose LDL is, is bad. <clears throat> there are a variety of criteria we use, but just in general, uh, we want total cholesterol to be below 200. We want our LDL below 130. And these days, we kind of want it below 100. People who have heart disease, I try and keep them below 50. So all this is variable depending on one's underlying risk factors. Um, and once the cholesterol starts going up, it's borderline high. And somebody whose bad cholesterol is over 160 is really having high cholesterol. And the same thing holds for HDL. We want HDL more than 40 in men, more than 50 in women. And if it's lower, that again puts the person at a slightly higher risk. The other problem we run into is high blood pressure. High blood pressure is called the silent killer because you know, it doesn't cause any symptoms. And, for, and it's also preventable. If we knew what our blood pressure was, we would control it and it would cause less damage. And 78 million people, uh, million adults have it. The unfortunate part is that despite this burden, less than half of it is on, uh, less than half the patients have it under control. So one in four adult Americans has high blood pressure and nearly one third of them don't even know that they have it. It's because you know, either it's not being checked or um, you know, it's being checked infrequently. Um, you know, just very quickly, uh, the numbers we, we focus on, there is a, when we take the blood pressure, uh, there is two numbers we get. One is what we call the systolic blood pressure, the top number or the diastolic blood pressure, which is the uh, um, uh, bottom number. And how can you tell if you have high blood pressure? And most people, you can't. Unless it's really, really high, um, um, you know, you won't know. I get patients when we notice that their blood pressure is high. I talk to them about doing things to control the blood pressure. And, you know, in case, some instances, we do need medicines. And I try and talk to them about it. And the reaction is, well, you know, I feel fine. And therefore, I don't need to do anything about it. <clears throat> but that's not true. That is why it's called the silent killer. And the only way you know that you have high blood pressure is really to get it checked. And whether it's with your doctor or, or by doing it by yourself. So <clears throat> what is a normal blood pressure? Normal blood pressure is less than 120 upper number and less than 80. You know, there was a school of thought at one point that as we age, um, you could uh, accept a slightly higher blood pressure. But we're learning more and more that for most people, for most people, 120, 80 is the right number irrespective of age. So once you start climbing up 120 to 130, but still less than 80, it's elevated blood pressure. Once you cross like 130 or so, and the lower number above 80, that is now called hypertension. And there are various stages. As you get higher, uh, that uh, uh, burden of, of the disease process increases. So, so the higher it is, the more the stress on the body and higher the incidence of uh, heart issues. The other problem we have is diabetes, and that's a huge burden across, across the country. Uh, the problem with diabetics is that they are two to three times uh, more prone to have heart disease than those folks who are not diabetic. Uh, statistics show that a third of diabetics wound up with coronary stents. Uh, and, or, or actually, let me rephrase. So, so the what it showed was that a third of the patients who wound up with stents actually had diabetes. And in the diabetic population, the incidence of heart disease or heart attacks is very high. And there is a 60% chance of dying from heart disease in a diabetic. So diabetes is a huge issue. And we need to do a, a you know, better job in avoiding being diabetic. Um, part of the problem with diabetes is that diabetics, largely because they are overweight, uh, not all of the, not everybody, but a lot, lot of them are overweight. They also have high blood pressure uh, and high cholesterol. So kind of it becomes uh, a problem where heart disease occurs because of all the factors we talked about, including diabetes, because all these problems occur in the same individual. The other problem we have is smoking. A smoker's risk of heart attack is more than twice that of non-smokers. And cigarette smoking is the biggest risk factor for sudden cardiac death. So um, uh, along with diabetes, hypertension, uh, smoking, and family history. So if in a, in a, in a family, if there is a, 
a family member who had, and, and it really is an immediate uh, family member. So parents or siblings, if they have um, heart disease at a young age, then that poses an additional risk uh, for, for a given individual. So now if somebody has some risk factors, you know, they typically present to us uh, either to get screened. So I get a lot of patients who say, you know what, my uh, family member had a heart problem or I'm diabetic and high blood, I have high blood pressure and I wanna make sure my heart is okay. So that's one subset of people. And then there's another subset of people who present and say, you know, I'm having a little discomfort here or a little discomfort there, or I get shortness of breath when I walk. So we have a variety of tools uh, which help us make a diagnosis if somebody has heart disease. So what are those tools? I mean, other than taking a good history and doing a physical examination, measuring the blood pressure, uh, we have uh, what's called an EKG or an electrocardiogram. So the EKG is looking at the electrical system of the heart. So the heart uh, has not only a plumbing, uh, 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 the plumbing of the heart, which is where, what, I, what we are talking about, but it also has an electrical system. So if the plumbing goes bad and it damages the heart muscle, then the electrical system gets impacted and we can see that on the EKG. Um, we can also get the person to do what's called a stress test. So what the stress test does is that we, in a controlled fashion, increase the heart rate and blood pressure of the individual. So every three minutes, the treadmill goes faster and higher. And we have leads which are hooked up and um, uh, uh, we're monitoring the EKG. And the premise is that if there is a blockage in an artery, uh, then with exercise, the heart will need more blood. And that uh, artery, which is clogged, will uh, not be able to deliver the amount of blood which is needed. And therefore, as electricity is flowing through the heart, it will have deviation, which we can pick up on the stress test. It's not a perfect tool. It's right about 60 to 70% of the times, but it's a safe and a commonly used inexpensive tool, which we use often. Now, in some people, if the stress test, the regular stress test with the electrical system is, is not right, then we go to what's called a nuclear stress test. Now, what we do in this is we inject a tracer through an IV line and that tracer has an affinity for the heart muscle. It goes into the heart and this camera goes around and, and depending on the amount of tracer which goes to different parts of the heart, uh, the camera picks up the signal and it sends it to a computer and the computer then creates an image of the heart uh, and we do two sets of scans. We do at rest and we do with exercise. And if somebody had a clogged artery, then a part of the heart, what happens is the arteries kind of get bigger because they have to deliver more blood with exercise. So a part of the heart would not get as much blood where there is a blockage, while the other parts of the heart will get more blood. And so when we see the scan, which kind of looks like this, uh, in this case, you know, the whole heart is kind of lighting up. Uh, although in the bottom part here, uh, there is a little uh, defect or it's not filling up enough, but it fills up. So this is how we can tell that if exercise, there is a part of the heart which doesn't fill enough, but it fills at rest, that indirectly we think that there is a blockage. So this is what's called a nuclear stress test. Um, it's a little more expensive, um, but it is right about 80 to 90% of the times as opposed to a regular stress test. But typically we would do a regular stress test first uh, and if that's a problem, then we go to a nuclear stress test, except if somebody is very high risk, then it's better to go this route. Another commonly used test these days is something called coronary calcium scoring. So the premise of this is that, <clears throat> that the coronary arteries, when they have plaque in them, uh, we are not able to see the plaque unless we put a camera inside or we do uh, other invasive tests. Um, plaque, which we looked at before in one of the previous pictures, not only has this cholesterol, but it can also attract calcium. And X-ray can see calcium. So we can do a special kind of CAT scan of the chest, which can focus on the arteries of the heart, and we can see um, um, how much of calcium is built up. And if um, the calcium buildup is high, it indirectly suggests that there is plaque in the artery. Now, plaque could be in the wall, and it may not be obstructing, so you don't necessarily have a correlation between a high calcium score and necessarily an obstruction, but the risk becomes high. So who should get it? You know, most people, um, 
you know, generally in the 45 to 65 age group, as we get older, past 65, 70, you know, just with aging, there is going to be some calcium. So the utility kind of goes down. And it, but anybody with some risk uh, would, would be helpful. So this is what it looks like. So this is a CAT scan. This person's calcium score is zero. Here are the arteries and they look okay. But here is somebody with a, high, with a score of 1200 because they have all this calcium build up in their arteries. So it's a, it's a screening test. And once you know that there is this high score, you, you know that there is plaque, even if you know, there is no symptom. And so one has to be careful with diet and exercise and all that. Now, if the stress test, stress nuclear scan, uh, or symptoms, or sometimes with the coronary calcium score, we find out that um, we find out that there is uh, this high probability of having a blockage. Then we go into uh, this kind of a suite, which is a cardiac uh, cat lab, where we are able to thread some plastic tubes and go up to the heart, and we can take some pictures. And uh, you know, the way we do that is either we get in through an artery in the groin and we thread a plastic tube up to the heart. Or these days we go through the wrist often, and that catheter makes its way to the heart, and we can inject dye, and we can see pictures like this. So here is an artery. This is the right artery of the heart, and there is this very very tight blockage. And this is how we are able to find out if somebody has a clogged artery or not. Now, you know what what kind of symptoms do people have if they have a heart problem? So especially if it's a heart attack. They, you know, one feels pressure in the center of the chest. This uh, pain can then, pain or heaviness or discomfort can travel to the shoulders, neck or arms. And that sometimes can be associated sweating, nausea, shortness of breath. So these are early warning signs. Not everybody who has chest discomfort has a heart issue because there are other tissues, but if you have discomfort, then at least this is something we should be considering and ruling out. Now, again, just to share again, this is a, a, a picture of somebody who unfortunately died and they took a section uh, and looked at it under the microscope. Uh, so here's what happened. This is the artery. This area here is where that plaque was. This is that cap and this cap, this cracked here and then blood was flowing through the opening of the artery and that blood clotted because it came in contact with this yellow plaque. And once this uh, clot completely closes the artery, that's what causes a heart attack. So this is uh, something we um, uh, want to obviously avoid. And, and we'll talk about strategies of how we make this core, the lipid core, so, uh, uh, harder so that this doesn't crack. That's our main goal, so that we don't have a heart attack. Now, if somebody does have discomfort, um, what happens is while the artery is closed, the heart muscle is undergoing damage. And that damage is almost completed within six hours. So it's critical that as soon as one has discomfort, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, suggestive that there might be a problem, one is very uncomfortable, one needs to call 911, get to the hospital, because in the emergency room, once you get in, uh, we see on the EKG that there is a problem uh, most hospitals in this area, including St. Peter's where I work or Robert Wood where I work or Princeton, uh, they have, uh, a, we have a cath lab. Uh, so I'm, you know, I, uh, I'm one of the interventional cardiologists um, and we would get called. And if I'm on call, you know, we show up in the hospital within 30 minutes of a person getting to the hospital and we take the whisk them to the cath lab where we can go in and do some procedures. So let's talk about what treatments do we have. So we. So just to do a quick recap, we, we know the heart is a pump, we know it needs nutrition, and that nutrition comes in through these arteries in the, uh, in the heart, and a variety of problems can cause problems within this artery. Uh, uh, diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, smoking, family history leads to this plaque buildup. And this plaque buildup can keep getting worse, and then it starts causing symptoms and finally can cause a heart attack. We have a variety of tools like stress testing, uh, stress nuclear scan, uh, 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 coronary calcium score, cardiac catheterization to find out what's wrong. And once we find out, what are the things we can do? So obviously we have medicines. Uh, we give aspirin because aspirin is like a blood thinner. It prevents that clot from forming. We give blood pressure medicines to control the blood pressure. 
extremely, extremely important as statins. And I can't tell you how often I get pushback from patients when I see their cholesterol is very high. You know, we do talk about diet and exercise, but despite that, if their cholesterol is high, I strongly recommend statins. Um, and it's unfortunate that a lot of people would then give us pushback and then wind up with a heart attack, which then doesn't help them. Uh, obviously controlling diabetes and um, uh, have, leading a healthy uh, lifestyle. So that we'll talk about in a second. Now, in somebody who continues to have discomfort, uh, we have tools where we can go in with a catheter, we thread a wire and then put a balloon and we can put stent. So stent is a metal mesh, which is not cleaning mm -hmm. up the artery. It's just put with the mesh basically compresses all the plaque to the side and we open up the artery like this. So that's a procedure. It's minimally invasive. You know, each person's a little different, but usually it takes about an hour to do. And generally the patients can go home either same evening or, or next day. Uh, the other option we have is what's called coronary artery bypass grafting or bypass surgery. So in that, what happens is the surgeon takes an artery from the chest wall and he hooks it up to a point beyond the blockage. So blood, instead of coming down across the blockage, now goes around and comes around like this. He also can take veins from the leg and hook up one end to the aorta and the other end to the artery. So basically think of like you're going on a road and a tree has fallen and closed the road, you create another passage. So that's kind of what an open heart surgery or bypass is. But the biggest, biggest thing, none of these procedures is a cure, okay? So that's very important to remember. So if somebody has a stent or they have a bypass, doesn't mean the problem went away. The problem was that they had something which was causing this plaque to build up. So unless we address those underlying reasons, you know, it's like a revolving door. The person's gonna have one heart attack after another or one stent after another and things will not change. So understanding this and understanding why this happens and addressing that is a crucial part of the treatment. So you wanna, if somebody is smoking, they need to quit. Obviously it's hard, it's not easy, but that causes a lot of damage. The other thing is to control high blood pressure. As I said earlier, it's a silent killer. You have to, you know, your blood pressure numbers. You've got to get moving. You have to lose weight. You have to exercise because that lowers blood pressure. And the other huge thing is to cut the salt. Salt, you know, average our, our diet, we, we actually need about two, two, three grams of salt a day but the average diet has 10 to 12 grams of salt. And you have to remember certain food items which you may not think you're adding salt, you know, the cheese and um, a ham and um, um, uh, uh, soups, uh, Chinese food. So they have a lot of salt in it. So you have to be cognizant of that and kind of control that. I have to lower your cholesterol, huge. Um, there's a lot of food items. Here example, egg yolk, fried stuff, uh, uh, red meat, beef and pork is really, really rich in cholesterol. So cutting the out, stopping it, uh, those are all strategies to lower cholesterol. Eat a lot more fruits and vegetables. That's really what the body needs. And all this extra cholesterol kind of goes down the arteries and then it sticks. It's almost like the kitchen sink. You don't have a strainer, stuff is going down. Sooner or later, it's gonna clog up. And then we have to control, control the, uh, um, uh, um, control diabetes. Um, so exercise, monitoring the sugar, eating healthy. Uh, these are all important uh, programs. Now, I was fortunate, you know, I started uh, uh, this practice called um, uh, uh, Cardiometabolic Institute. And four years ago, we started this uh, program called the Pritikin uh, Cardiac Rehab Program. This was started, uh, they were started by a gentleman back in the 50s uh, by the name of Robert Pritikin. And it's largely a plant-based diet, which um, um, uh, helps uh, patients learn the tenets of what's, um, what's not right. And we have this Pritikin Intensive Cardiac Rehab Program. So this is in Somerset, and it's been really a gratifying program because we're able to uh, teach people all the tenets, which I just told you. And it's meant for people who've had bypass surgery, stents, uh, heart attack, and, and that then enables them to learn because the angioplasty or stent they went through or the bypass they went through, as I said earlier, is not the cure for the cure for the disease. And this is kind of a picture of you know what it looks like on the inside. And then I just want to make a plug, as Karen said earlier, 
I do do a radio show. I've been doing it for almost 20 years, twice a month on 1170 AM. So I welcome all of you. It's an educational program. Um, you know, it's, it's just educating, but it's not just heart. I do a program on a variety of topics. So I just want to throw it out there. So at the end, um, you know, heart disease is still the most common cause of death. Uh, there are some factors we can control. We can control aging. We can control our genetics. We can control, um, uh, uh, you know, some of the factors which, are, which, which we can't help. However, uh, we can control what we are eating. We can control to a certain extent uh, smoking. Uh, we can control uh, exercise. We, we can take strategies to deal with stress. So all these things help us. So we have to take one step at a time. We take a, one unhealthy habit and replace them with healthier ones. We eat for heart health. And remember that calories count. And start walking. Start 10 minutes a day and then gradually 30 minutes a day. Uh, you know, count your steps. The recommendation is about 10,000 steps a day. So, so, but whatever you can do, it won't come in a day, but it does help. And a lot of vegetables, cutting back on red meat, cutting back on salt intake, and that can lead to a, a healthy life, you know, healthy heart and a longer life. And, and I'll end with this, programs like the Pritikin program, and there are other programs like this, uh, all they are is to show you the path and studies show that actually this plaque can be reversed. So there is evidence that if, if there is a blockage with tight control of all these things, including cholesterol and a healthy lifestyle, we can reverse these uh, blockages and prevent uh, heart attacks for the future. So uh, I hope uh, this was useful. And with that, I'll turn it to Karen, um, you know, in case there's any questions. Thank you, Dr. Sagal. This was um, so extremely informative. It looks like we have two questions. I'll read the first one, doctor. Sure. And then I'll read the second. The first one um, says, I recently read, hold on one second. I just, hold on, wait one minute. We, we just lost it. Oh, sorry. Hold on. Okay, here we go. Okay, actually okay. I, I can, I got the oh, question. You got it? Okay, yep, yep, yep. I'll let you read it. Yep. Um, so. I recently read that half of heart attacks happen to people who don't have the typical markers, no high blood pressure, cholesterol. Uh, can you speak to how we remain vigilant? What else we can do besides the typical screenings, but not in fear of an unknown problem? Yes. So it is true. I, I won't say half, but yes, there are there is a subset of people who don't have traditional risk factors. Uh, one of the challenges is, um, and I'll give you an example. Uh, someone has an LDL, um, let's say of 110, which is really not that bad. Uh, there is a genetic marker, and I do that often when people come to me for screening. It's called lipoprotein little a. Uh, so it's a kind of fat in the body, lipoprotein little a. If that is elevated, then the LDL is even more serious and more dangerous for that given individual. So if, if their LDL is 100, and somebody whose lipoprotein little a is high, and, 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 and that's, that runs in families, and it's not normally measured, then that LDL, I almost think that it's like 300 for that person. So that's one person who otherwise would think that they don't have a risk factor, but they really do because of this genetic predisposition. Um, um, so that's one area. Um, you know, then there is um, um, within that cholesterol number, the LDL, uh, there are particles. There are people whose numbers don't look that high and, and they uh, uh, their LDL, particle count is very high and a smaller particle and large number of particles can cause more plaque buildup. So that's another issue. Then there is the person who's kind of pre-diabetic, you know, hemoglobin A1C is let's say six, which doesn't look too bad. And they may think that there's no risk, but the problem is that what we have learned with diabetes and pre-diabetes is that the risk is about the same, whether the diabetes is uncontrolled. Or... So what technically may look like as no risk factor, but there are still some risk factors. And then there are instances in young women, sometimes we'll get somebody who don't have the traditional risk factors. And the reason for the clot buildup is not so much plaque buildup, but there is erosion or the inner lining of the artery, which attracts clot. And some people will have a spasm. So, so I, I, I'm not sure it's half, but there is a subset of people whose uh, risk factors are not as apparent as, as they might be. And we think that they are fine and this is happening to them. 
So, so that probably is the best answer I can, I can give you. So at the end, obviously you don't have to remain in fear. I think the best strategy is get your blood pressure checked, get your cholesterol checked. If you have a risk factor like prediabetes or family history, then there is some additional screening we can do uh, and live a healthy lifestyle, you know, control stress, uh, exercise, eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. So um, there's another pay, per question here. Having a parent who died from stroke, is that considered a significant risk factor for heart disease? You know, in the traditional description of risk factors, when we look at uh, risk for, uh, for a child or a sibling, we generally count a previous heart attack at a young age. Uh, that's generally what's considered. Having said that, there is an element of um, uh, similarity between a stroke and a heart attack because it depends on why the stroke took place. You know, strokes can occur because of this arrhythmia atrial fibrillation where a clot from the heart kind of goes up to the brain. That is independent of a, you know, a hereditary risk. However, if the plaque is because the arteries in the neck have clogged up, then it's the same blood which is floating around in the rest of the body too. So if somebody has plaque at a younger age, but if that same stroke took place in the 70s, 80s, 90s, that risk is not as much uh, for, a, for a child uh, as opposed to something which happened when the parent was in the 40s, 50s. Uh, and most strokes generally happen in an older age. So it's not as much of a risk as that of a heart attack. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that's Karen's message. Does angina have anything to do with heart disease? Absolutely. So let me explain angina. Angina is chest discomfort, which is coming from the heart because of lack of blood flow. That's called angina. So uh, when an artery gets clogged and there is not enough blood flow through that artery and the heart isn't getting enough blood, then one is having discomfort and that discomfort we call angina. So yes, angina is because of, of a heart issue. Uh, can exercise and plant food reverse the chances of heart attack? Does it require medications too? Um, so uh, exercise definitely uh, is, is helpful. Um, and um, I'm not sure if you meant um, uh, if it's, you know, if it's, if you're referring to plant-based diet, uh, then yes. Um, a uh, lot of studies, there's a lot of work which has shown that food free of red meat, um, and in some cases, largely plant-based. You know, there are some big names I'll throw out there who've been in this arena. Uh, Dean Ornish is a cardiologist out of California. He's a strong proponent of plant-based diet. Um, there is uh, a Dr. Ezelstein out of Cleveland Clinic who's a big proponent of plant-based diet and Pritikin program is largely a plant-based diet. And there is evidence that exercise, good nutrition, largely with a plant-based diet and stress management. I, I, I would like to state that that's huge and it shouldn't be understated. So, um, you know, some of my patients who have uh, really bad arteries are ones who are type A personalities, control, trying to control everything you know, they tend to have a lot more problem than folks who are somewhat more relaxed. So a healthy mindset. So we say stress management, doing some meditation, yoga, uh, going out for a walk, um, having a dog, surrounding yourself with loved ones. Uh, you know, that all is, um, 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 is, uh, is helpful. Uh, so hopefully, I don't see any other questions. So Karen, I'm going to hand this over to you. Okay, well, I'd like to uh, thank the doctor. This was such a wonderful and informative session. And um, Dr. Sagal, thank you so much for appreciating how important health literacy is to everyone to educate and help us all learn to live our healthiest life possible through the best information. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, thank you. And, I want to remind everyone that this will be posted on YouTube. It will be on the library's uh, health portal as well. So uh, please look for it soon and send me an email message if you'd like me to send you the doctor's slides. So thank you again, doctor, and thank you everyone. And I wish everyone a very good evening.